Good morning, church. Go ahead and find your seats, please, and we will begin this morning. Okay, we've got a number of announcements this morning. First of all, tonight, be here at 6 p.m. Steve Curro is going to give us a report on uh, his travels to Panama and uh, describe the work that's being done there by God. Also, Britain was able to join him as well. So we're going to hear uh, what they were able to accomplish and to see. I'm looking forward to it. I'd love to hear about mission work being done all, all over the world. So tonight at 6 p.m., Steve Curl will give us a presentation on that work. Uh, December 17th will be our Christmas party slash brunch slash gift exchange. Always a good time. Uh, we're going to set a gift limit of $15. And I, I prefer, it's my opinion, that we have nice gifts because then it creates a lot of stealing, which is fun. Uh, last year, if you remember, Glenn Hardy set a world record for the number of gifts that he had stolen from him. 72. I wasn't keeping track, but it was roughly in that neighborhood. Um, so that's December 17th. Be here at 10 a.m. for brunch and then the gift exchange to follow. Also, the kiddos, uh, is it the youth group and up exchange with the adults? Okay. And then uh, so uh, elementary age and down will exchange with one another. Uh, to continue our Stronger Families series, on January 29th, Brett Petrillo will be here. It's a Sunday night at 6 o'clock, January 29th, to give a lesson entitled The War for Our Teens. I've heard his material over uh, a number of years, and it is one of the lessons that I probably refer to, uh, I refer to it often, so it's uh, important information, the war for our teens, January 29th. And then on March 4th, uh, my dad, Daniel Petrillo, will be here on a Saturday to give his How We Got the Bible seminar. All I'll say as a testimony to how good it is is that he has roughly 100 requests across the world to come and deliver his How We Got the Bible seminar per year. So it's good. You need to be here for that. Um, finally, uh, don't forget to grab a blessing bag on the way out or multiple bags. Those are designed to give out to people as you see them having need. Maybe someone who is uh, asking for money on the corner of a street. You can hand them a bag that is uh, equipped with gloves, socks, water, Bibles, and some other items. Uh, you don't have to ask if you can get one. They're in the back corner there. Grab several of those and give those out as you see the need. Is there anything else this morning? If you have forgotten the, thank you, Rich. Uh, if you have forgotten to grab yourselves communion, they're in the baskets in the back. Feel free to get up and grab those at any time for communion. Uh, Rich has some Eastern European missions announcements. A few weeks ago, we announced that the elders had approved $600 out of the church budget to be co contributed to Eastern European missions for the distribution of Bibles to those who request them, and they're in their own language and they're free of charge. But we've also have the opportunity as individuals to add to that amount and as of next Sunday, that's the last opportunity that you'll have to do that if you haven't already done so. And then the, uh, a single check will be issued to Eastern European missions uh, for the distribution of Bibles. Uh, if you wish to contribute and haven't done so and do, want to do it by check, write the check to Church of Christ and in the memo line, put EEM so it gets flagged for that purpose and deposit it in the 
contribution boxes in the back. There are a couple of new developments in EEM that I've been aware of in just the last couple of weeks, and that is the request for Ukrainian Bibles has doubled since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The uh, dark clouds of war and hardship do have silver linings because it seems that people under those conditions tend to reevaluate their priorities. And maybe there's a lesson in there for us as well. And uh, also, the uh, EEM has been working with the the uh, schools in North Macedonia. Now, North Macedonia is just north of Greece and the southern part of what used to be Yugoslavia uh, from a geographical standpoint. They are working with the, with the, the schools and the, that work has been so well accepted that the North Macedonian uh, government has asked, had asked the uh, representatives from EEM and the government and the religious leaders of the area to meet at the capital to discuss this. Now the uh, religious leaders uh, are Greek Orthodox. That's the main uh, church in, uh, in North Macedonia. And they are very, very supportive of that. Uh, they gave a, a message to the EEM individuals uh, expressing their, their support of that effort. And the, the, the final sentence of that message essentially was, uh, on behalf of the children of North Macedonia, for the concern and for the gift of Bibles, we thank you. So keep in mind, next Sunday is your last opportunity to participate in this congregational effort. Let's, oh, James. Just real quick, next, next Sunday morning will be the first uh, young adult class in downstairs the Bible class house. Okay. Let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, it is so good to be here this morning. And I, uh, I, I am encouraged by every soul here in attendance this morning because uh, they have chosen to put you first with their time uh, and energy this morning. Father, of course, you are so worthy of, uh, of honor. You are so worthy of our worship. There is none other like you. Uh, no, none other that is worthy of, uh, of our uh, humble adoration. Father, thank you for the things that you have done for us. As we understand in, in your word, in the book of Hosea, you are the one that provides. And so, of course, you are the one that is worthy of, of, of our faithfulness to you. And uh, Father, we, lo we love you. And even though we are human beings, we fall short, we make mistakes. Uh, thank you for your patience toward us and your love uh, of us that uh, we might have another opportunity to, uh, to serve you, to uh, better ourselves for the work of your kingdom. God, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and the example that he left for us to follow. Uh, of course, his footsteps are the perfect life to lead uh, according to your will. God, I accept our worship this morning uh, as we come to you now in song. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let's all be standing for our first song this morning. Our first song this morning will be Christ, We Do All Adore Thee. <laughs> Christ, we do all adore Thee, and we do praise Thee forever. Christ, we do all adore Thee, and we do praise Thee forever. 
seated, please. Had it not been the Lord. Had it not been the Lord who was on our side, had it not been the Lord who was on our side, the anger of the enemy would have swallowed us alive, had it not been. Bible I'd recently purchased, instead of having headers to study Bible, it gives me the opportunity to read through the text and identify the context and theme myself and write uh, at the top what I think it is. Before we take of the fruit of the vine and the bread, I'm going to read Isaiah 53, starting in verse 2. As I'm going through it, I want you to think in your head, what comes to mind as the theme? What would you title this chapter? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the inequity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, we considered that he was cut off out of the land for the living, for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with wicked men, Yet he was the, with a rich man in his death, 
because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offering, offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hands. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their inequities. Therefore, I will not allot him a portion with the great. I, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. It's pretty heavy scripture from the Old Testament. To me, I think it seems quite clear as to what it's speaking of here. I went through a number of thoughts on what I would call this, but in the end was curious as to what other Bibles had already titled this one, and I felt it was uh, appropriate, the suffering servant. This morning, remember this, remember Jesus, his sacrifice, that he came here knowingly to suffer for us so that we can have hope and eternal life with him. Let us pray. Lord, we are so blessed that you love us so greatly, that you provide for us, and that before we were born, you had a plan for us, that through the generations we see a thread of Jesus, the plan of salvation, the opportunity for us to have a way to face you again, blameless, to be with you in heaven. We naturally search for paradise, Lord, and, and we believe that th heaven, the ultimate paradise, is what we should be facing, Lord, and searching for. And we thank you for your son who has given us this opportunity to have salvation so we may be in that paradise with you one day. May you bless, bless this bread as we partake of it. And it's in your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Let us pray for the fruit of the vine. Almighty Heavenly Father, we are in awe at what your son did for us. The pain that he felt physically, the pain that he felt emotionally, the scourging, the mocking, the humiliation. Yet the fact he had his eyes set on our well-being and on your will and endured it for us is just unbelievable father and hard for us to grasp and we're thankful for such love and for Jesus's greatness Lord this morning may we be of humble mind and heart and examine ourselves in comparison to Jesus and how we can live our lives to take full advantage of the blood that was shed for us may you bless this cup and it's in your son's holy name we pray amen
while Jesus was the ultimate gift and best thing God could have given to us, he still continues to provide for us and give to us. He gives to us materials to enjoy, luxuries, finances, food to eat, places to live. This time we're going to say a prayer to give back a portion of what God has given to us. You can do that in the back, in the black boxes, digitally, or, or mail it in. But as we pray, I want you to remember how richly blessed we really are and how much we are given that we don't deserve. And yet, like the lilies of the valley, God continues to provide for us, take care of us, and give us abundantly more than we are deserving of. Let us pray. Wonderful Lord, we thank you for the means that you give us, the talents and opportunities we have to, to work and to earn money and to uh, do work for you and not for man, Lord, and that you bless us for that work and for our striving and that you give to us abundantly uh, many different things, Lord, uh, the necessities to live and also things to enjoy in life, Father. And while you give to us so much, Lord, and you are not needing of anything, we pray that what we give back to you, we give from our heart with joy, and that you will see our love through our giving, and that we will use these funds to further your kingdom and to benefit your will. We thank you so much, again, for your son and for all you provide us with. And it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. If you would, let's go ahead and be standing for the next couple songs before the lesson this morning. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God. My Savior, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God. My soul.
448. After the song, we'll have our scripture reading followed by our lesson. <clears throat> Love one another for love is of God. He who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God for God. Scripture reading for this morning will be from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. And it reads, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known, made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpass all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Good morning, everybody. If you could talk to one person in the Bible, who would it be? Aside from the obvious, Jesus or God. There are a lot of people that come to mind, you know, going back into the Old Testament, I think about, uh, Noah and what he faced and what he had to build and how long it took 
how was he feeling seeing the animals come and going on to the ark and then seeing the, the water uh, crash or come up from the depth of the earth and have it fall for that long? I think about Abraham and think about going into this unknown country, this unknown place, and, and the things in which he saw and the things that we, which he witnessed to be able to see the land of Canaan and to see what it, you know, it's described as, as that which flows with milk and honey. And I, I wonder what that actually looks like, what it really looks like. Of course, I think about it in the New Testament. I think about it, I want to talk to Paul and you know, what he saw on, on the road to Damascus how he felt there when he was there confronted by Jesus himself and, and how that, that intercession there with Jesus completely changed his view. He did a 180 degree turn there with Jesus talking to him on the road to Damascus. And I wonder about John and what he saw there at the transfiguration of Jesus and hearing God's voice saying, follow him. And then seeing there and, and being there with, with Moses and Elijah. And then, you know, you see in the, in the, in the verses there where it says that, you know, Moja and Moses, Moses, Moja, that's Elijah and Moses put together for those of you who want to be more efficient with your speech like I do quite often. Moses and Elijah are there, and, you know, and then the, the passage tells us there, tells us that, but how do they know? You know, did you know right then that that's who that was? Did it say, hello, my name is Moses, and they have a sticker on there, and I'm Elijah. Like, how, how did they know that? What, what, what clued them in, or, or did Jesus tell them, or did they just know kind of instinctly, this is who this is? And, of course, one of the ones that I'd like to talk to is David. David, of course, when he you know, faces whom? Goliath. Standing there, you know, as, a, as a, a young man, small, looking at this behemoth of a man who's nine and a half feet tall, and you're going in there with the confidence that you're going to take him out, and you have no worries or concerns about it at all. You know, I, I'd like to, to just talk to him about what he felt like that. But also with David, it wouldn't be just Goliath. I'd want to ask him about some of his psalms. Some of the psalms he has written are amazing. Some of the psalms that he has written almost feel like I could have written them. Maybe not as, as eloquent uh, as, as he is, as you go back to my Moses uh, reference. Uh, but the way that he, he used the words and described himself, I, I want to know what he's thinking. I want to know what he was worried. I want to know what his enemies were. I want to I pick his brain as to why he wrote some of the words that he did. Because I think some of the places in Psalms is where we can find some of the most comfort that is offered by scriptures. Because I think, I think David teaches us something that I think we often forget. And I want to just look at a, a couple of Psalms first before I make that point, and then I'm going to make that point with the Psalms that we look at. So turn with me in your Bibles first to Psalm 13. And as we're reading through some of these psalms, I want you to ask yourself these questions. Are these some of the same things? Are these some of the same words or questions that maybe you've asked in your lifetime? Maybe you're asking right now. But look at Psalm 13. David says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Have you ever asked these questions before? How long, Lord? Maybe sometimes it does feel like God is not answering us, that God's not responding to our requests, that God is not responding to our pain. And so we ask, how long, God? How long? Are, are, are you going to forget me forever? Because I think sometimes there is that case where we do feel like we may have been forgotten. David writes this here in, in Psalm 13. But then look with me at a familiar psalm in, verse, or in chapter 23. This is the same 
David. Now, we don't know, you know, we don't know what years have transpired between this, but I want us to see something here. Look at Psalm 23, a very familiar psalm to us, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see the difference there in Psalm 13 and in Psalm 23? You see the difference in what David is feeling, what David may be going through? Look at Psalm 25. Psalm 25, look at verse 16. Verse 16 says, Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Look upon my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Look upon my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with violent hatred. Guard my soul and deliver me. Do not let me be ashamed, for I take refuge in you. Now again, we don't know exactly what time has transpired between these psalms, but do you see a difference between the David in Psalm 13 and the David in Psalm 23? And then again, the Psalm of David in Psalm 25? What does this tell us? What is, what is this principle that tells us in someone who... Now David is, is regarded as what? Remember? What does God call David? A man after my own heart. We see in Psalm 13 that he's wondering why God has forsaken him. He also says that in Psalm 22. In Psalm 23, he says, I shouldn't fear anything. I don't fear anything. God leads me through the valley of the shadow of death. When I'm faced with death, I don't fear evil because God leads me. Yet in Psalm 25, he goes on to, Psalm 25, he goes on to say that my enemies are surrounding me, that my heart is, is, is down, is loaded with grief. I feel afflicted on every side, God. Brethren, if, if anything, what Psalms teaches us, through David's Psalms especially, is life can be hard, but God is good. Life can be hard, but God is good. Go back to Psalm 13. Psalm 13, he says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Basically, how long can I deal with this on my own? I'm counseling my own self, and I'm, I'm a grieving person who's counseling a grieving person. How am I going to be able to do this? And he says, consider, verse 3, consider and answer me, O Lord my God, enlighten my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. I'm going to die. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. My adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. But notice what he says here in verse 5. He's up to this point here, life can be hard. But verse 5, but I have trusted in your life, in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. See, David knows that life can be hard, but God is good. But God is good. Look over back at Psalm 25. Verse 16 again, he says, Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Look upon my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. 
Look upon my enemies, verse 19, for they are many, and they hate me with a violent hatred. Guard my soul and deliver me. Do not let me be ashamed, for I take refuge in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Someone approached me a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about patience, and how patience is usually in the New Testament. That patience, the word patience or the idea is not found so much in the Old Testament, but what is found in the Old Testament that is kind of similar to, synonymous to patience is waiting. In the Old Testament, there is constant references to, I wait for you. I am waiting on the Lord. And David ultimately waits on the Lord. Why? Because God is good. Life can be hard, but God is good. And so he's going to wait on the Lord. Turn with me to just to Psalm 27. Psalm 27, look at verse 11. Psalm 27, verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. Verse 13. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. In the land of the living, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. David is saying here that he is seeing violence everywhere, that he doesn't want to be taken by his enemies, that he wants to stay on the right path because he fears also the influence of his enemies. And he sees a lot of horrible things in his life. And he's wondering about them to God. But he says, but I would have despaired had I not believed in God that I would see goodness. And notice that he says here, he qualifies that goodness with in the land of the living. He's not talking about the goodness that is yet to come because David believed in a resurrection even though it's not talked as much about in the Old Testament as it in the New Testament, David believed in the resurrection. David believed that he would see his son, his babe who died because of his sins. David stopped his mourning at one point because he believed he would see his son again. But David says, I would have despaired had I not believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord again. And I think sometimes we may find ourselves in such a place where we're like David, asking all of these questions, but we're not coming to the conclusion that God is still good. Life can be hard. I think about Drew. Drew Guess, our brother Drew, who is in the hospital right now, being brought to the doctor's terms to the point of, of the brink of death in order to try to stop his MS from just continuing. But if you've ever talked to Drew... You come away not distraught, not concerned over his health, but built up, encouraged. Why is that? Drew knows that life can be hard, but he also knows what? That God is good. That God is good. I think about Linda Tootin at home, maybe watching right now, who has not been with us for over two years now, just about. That she's shut in because of her pain, physically. And then also that compounds and makes it an emotional pain. 
Every day she lives with horrific pain. I talked to her a couple of weeks ago. She talked a little bit about her pain. She talked about her struggles. But at the end, she knows that God is good. Life can be hard. But God is good. I think about poor Delphinia. Just a couple of weeks ago, getting in that car accident. You're not ready for something like that. You're turning in. You're going to church after all, right? Nothing's supposed to happen bad to you on your way to church, right? And you get rear-ended. And if you've ever been in an accident, it's a lot more than just the physical pain. There's fear. There's anxiety. There's episodes of, of tears that don't seem to end because it's just scary. You get hit by something, your, your life can flash before you. But isn't it awesome to see her here this morning? God is good. There are a lot of us in here that deal with chronic pain, with chronic suffering. I think of Lance. What an amazing, amazing brother in Christ that we have in Lance. And the suffering that he's gone through for the entirety of his life. He's probably hating it right now that I'm talking about him. Because that's not Lance. He doesn't talk about it. You can talk to him about it. He'll be happy to share it with you. But he's not going to come up and bring it up to you. Because that's not what he's dwelling on. Lance dwells on the fact that God is good, even though his life is hard. He gets so excited, you can't help but smile when you're around him. When he gets, he's got this manly, I'm going to call it manly. When he gets excited about something, he can't contain it. We were with him a few weeks ago. We were up, at the, up, at, up, up in the mountains, and he's trying to tell us a joke. And he can't get the joke out because he's laughing about the joke. And so he's just laughing the whole time, and we're just kind of sitting here waiting for the punchline, not even the punchline, but actually the entirety of the joke. And he's just giggling. That's a man who loves God and who sees beyond his circumstances to know that life is hard, but God is good. There are so many others that I could bring up in this congregation. Maybe you're one yourself where life has been hard. I think of the Morrison Mazur family and their losses. Life can be hard. I think that's what one of the things that David teaches us. He is a man after God's own heart, yet there are times when he is asking God, what is going on? I don't understand it. I'm struggling. I'm scared. I'm afraid. My enemies are coming in at, at any moment or surrounding me, God. And when it gets to the end, it is, it is almost always the same. Either I will wait on you, Lord, or I'm going to trust on your loving kindness. <sighs> Turn me to Psalm 28. <clears throat> Psalm 28, verse 1, it says, To you, O Lord, I call my rock. But then he says, Do not be deaf to me, for if you are silent to me, I will become like those who go down to the pit. In other words, I'm going to be dead. I'm going to die. Verse 2, Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to help to you. When I lift my hands towards your sanctuary. Now notice here the going back and forth between the hands. 
Verse 2 again, hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you for help, when I lift up my hands towards your holy sanctuary. Do not, verse 3, do not drag me away with the wicked and with those who work iniquity, who speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. Give them according to their work and according to the evil of their practices. Give them according to the deeds of their hands. Give them, repay them their recompense. And then notice verse 5, because they do not regard the works of the Lord, nor the deeds of his hands. You have the word hands here used three times. One is in reference to David. And David is pleading with God, much like this picture here. He is pleading towards God, the holy sanctuary. We don't know if he is pleading towards heaven, or perhaps he may be pleading towards the holy of holies where God's presence is. Either way, he is pleading to God. And the idea here when he's pleading to God is he's, it is a gesture of giving it to God and saying, God, I can't. God, I can't. I'm giving it to you. Please, God, help me. I cannot do this. And then he goes on, he's like, and then all these, others, these other evil people who, who are proud about the work of their hands and what they're doing. And they're finding salvation in their own work and what they're doing. And they don't know the work of your hands, God. That you created all of this. And you alone are the one that can save me. So then, notice what he says here then. After this request of God, do not be deaf to me. Please don't turn away from me. Please, please listen to my pleas. Verse 6, he says, Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplication. Remember that in verse 2. Hear the voice of my supplication when I cry to you for help. Verse 6, because he has heard the voice of my supplication, I am praising the Lord. Verse 7, the Lord is my strength. The Lord is my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. And so therefore, because my heart trusts in him, my heart exalts. And then with song, I shall thank him. He says he's my strength and my shield. Both offense and defense. God is there for our offense and he's there for our defense. He gives us our strength to push on. Because we can't do it on our own. And he gives us a shield to be defended against our enemies. Against the fiery darts of Satan. Against our own self. And sometimes doubt. Look at Psalm 31. Verse 9, it says, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am distressed. My eye is wasted away from grief, my soul and my body also, for my life is spent with sorrow, and my years with crying. My strength has failed because of my iniquity and my body has wasted away. Because of all my adversaries, I have approach, especially to my neighbors and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I am forgotten as a dead man out of mind. I am like a broken vessel for I have heard the slander of many. Terror is on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they schemed to take away my life. Have you ever felt like these words that David is expressing? Feeling like a broken vessel. Feeling like there's people around you who are slanding your name. Maybe there's rumors that are going around about you. David has felt this. Remember Psalm 23. We read Psalm 23 and we think... Wow, the confidence, wow, the faith. But David, it's not that he had a lack of faith, but life can be hard. 
but he knows God is good. And so notice what he says in verse 14. Even after he says these things, he says, but as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. What an amazing confession. You are my God. My times are in your hand. Can we say that? When we are faced with all the things that we are faced, when we are dealing with all the things that we are dealing, at the end of the day, David here says, you are my God, and my times are in your hands. You are my God. My times are in your hands. I think that's a difficult thing for us to say. But it's ultimately what David is able to say because he is someone who loves his God. Despite what he faces. Despite what he's gone through. David has loved and lost He's been inundated with his own sin. He's been, tried, he's, he's, uh, been uh, attempted murder on his life several times. Almost killed in battle. David has gone through a lot. David is like us. And the more that you read through his psalms that he has written, you realize how much he is truly like us. There are so many more psalms that I could go through and spend an easily another 30 minutes to an hour. I, I've got more written down that I would recommend you go and spend some time on your own on the psalms of David. And ultimately see where his prayers lead him. His prayers to God lead him to a place of peace. Notice Psalm 34. Let me read this. <clears throat> and start in verse 15. Psalm 34 says, verse 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord, verse 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Many, listen, many are the afflictions of the righteous. The Lord delivers them out of them all. You could write down there next to it, life can be hard, but God is good. And ultimately, at the end of Psalm 28, verse 26, and we're about ready to sing here in just a moment. After his cry to help, after he's pleading in his hands to God to help him, to let, him, to let God know that he can't do it on his own, that he doesn't want to be dragged away with the, uh, with the wicked. He doesn't want to be so influenced by the iniquity of those around him that he does not have a place with God and with, his, uh, with his, those that are righteous. But he says at the end here in verse 6, Psalm 28, Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplication. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. Therefore, because I trust in him, my heart exalts. And with my song, I shall thank him. We read from Philippians chapter 4, 4 through 7. It says, Rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Let all your, uh, cast all your cares or let all your anxieties and supplications be made to him. And the peace of the Lord, which guards your hearts and your minds, will be given. 
And in, the, in that prayer that Paul says, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. With thanksgiving, because even though the principle we've read that we thought about today is life can be hard, God is ultimately good. And he hears our prayers. And sometimes as Psalm 13 reminds us of, go back and read Psalm 13. At the end of that passage in Psalm 13, it's a recognition that it's not our time, it's God's time. It's on his clock. It's not on ours. And that's why we wait anxiously for him and look forward to him because he is so good. There are many in here I know that are struggling with lots of things. More than what was mentioned, I'm sure there's not a, one person in here who can't say they're struggling with something this morning that can't find some sort of similarity to what David said this morning. Just because I didn't mention you this morning doesn't mean that you don't have any great difficulty in what you're going through, whether it's chronic pain, whether it's deep depression, whether it's anxiety, things that stop you from doing life. God knows it all. God knows this life can be hard. But he wants you to know that he loves you. And he wants you to give all, give it all to him. If you're struggling this morning and want to do that and need the prayers of this congregation, please let this congregation wrap you up and hug on you and love on you and be there to support you if you need it. Let us stand and let us sing. I found my friend He won me by his love I'll serve him all my years of time and dwell with him above his yoke is easy, his burden is light. I found it so, I found it so. His service is my sweetest delight. His blessings ever flow. No other Lord but Christ I know. I walk with him alone. His streams of love forever flow within my heart, his throne. His yoke is easy, his burden is light. I found it so, I found it so. His service is my sweetest delight. His blessings ever flow. He's dearer to my heart than life. He found me lost in sin. He calmed the sea of inward strife and bid me come to him. His yoke is easy, his burden is light. I found it so, I found it so. His service is my sweetest delight. His blessings ever flow. My flesh recoiled before the cross, and Satan whispered there, Thy gain will not repay the loss. His yoke is hard to bear. His yoke is easy, his burden is light. I found it so, I found it so. His service is my sweetest delight. His blessings ever flow. I've tried the road of sin and found its prospects all deceive. I prove the Lord and joys abound more than I could believe. 
His yoke is easy, his burden is light. I found it so, I found it so. His service is my sweetest delight. His blessings ever flow. Thank you, James, for uh, another excellent lesson this morning. We're glad to have you here uh, with us. And uh, our, to our visitors, we are grateful you're here, and we ask you to stay around for just a minute and uh, let us get to meet you. And uh, uh, we also have uh, some bulletins back there. If you did not get that uh, off our website, uh, we have some of those back there on those back tables, and there's a lot of information uh, in there as well. And um, uh, we do want to remind you again tonight, uh, Steve will be talking to us uh, about, our, uh, about the missions going on, the mission work going on in Panama and, and uh, South America area down there. So, um, so make your plans to, uh, to be here tonight because we, um, we do help support uh, some efforts down there. And uh, so uh, it'll be real interesting to see what's going on. Uh, Steve just got back from there uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he's got a lot of good information to share with us. So if there's nothing else, let's go ahead and bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we, uh, we are so blessed to, to be here this morning. We're so grateful uh, for our time together to worship you. Lord, you are good. You are our Lord and our Savior and our hope, and Lord, we trust in you. And, Lord, we're so grateful for what you have done for us. We always give thanks to you in, in all things, uh, our life, our, our provisions that you give to us, and our salvation. Lord, let us always uh, remember uh, each and every day that we, when we wake up what you've done for us and, uh, and what we can do uh, to live our lives better. Lord, uh, we ask you to bless our efforts here as this congregation strives to, uh, to, to do your will and to encourage and edify one another and uh, to spread the gospel message. Lord, give us the strength and determination now to live our lives, to glorify you, um, and let us always be an influence to those, those, people, those peoples that, uh, that are in our lives uh, that we influence. Lord, we ask you to, to be with our sick and those suffering um, uh, from life's difficulties. We, we are mindful of many of our number here uh, that are going through those things, and, and uh, we ask you to, to be with them, to comfort them, and let us uh, help out in any way that we can. Lord, as we leave here this morning, we ask you to be with each, each and every one of us and let us um, always strive uh, to to reach out to one another, to reach out to those that are lost in this world. And uh, Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and the sacrifice that was made for us. And it's through him that we pray. Amen.